Uh, are y'all ready for me to rant a bit? So I'm gonna talk to you, uh, mano e mano, or mano e female no, about something that's kind of bothering me for uh, quite a while, and it's the excessive use of tier lists like these. So those are those S through F letter rankings that people use to judge anything from like cereal boxes to bicep exercise growth indicators. And given that human judgment falls within my discipline's area of expertise, I have some things to say about them. You see these all over the place. And in short, my problem with them is that they give you the illusion of being objective and informative when they really are not. So let's step back in time, shall we? To identify the history of these tier lists. Where did they come from and why are they so popular? Well, after a bit of research, I found out that uh, it has origins in fighter games. Like Street Fighter. <laughs> that was a good game, man. Or maybe I'm thinking of Mortal Kombat. Weren't those like the same thing? Anyway. And Smash Brothers. And so what gamers would do is they would, uh, they would come up with these tier lists to use for strategic reasons. So they would basically give these characters a ranking based on which ones win the most. Or frame data, like uh, how many frames it takes for a fighter to recover from a hit or something like that. So it seemed they started out pretty objective. And the whole S tier comes from a Japanese grading system, apparently, where S is for super or special. But that's probably like in Japanese. Does super or special start with an S? The Japanese word for S? I don't know. Anyway, apparently that's where it comes from. And then it spread as viruses often do. A plague on the mind. And it became widespread around 2018 when somebody came up with the website Tier Maker, which made it super easy for anybody to do a tier ranking thing. And so since then, it's been adopted by YouTubers a lot and streamers and Reddit as a super fast and convenient way to rank just about anything. And so I've seen it used for serials, fonts, Disney villains, etc. So they're used all over the place because they're easy to produce and they generate a lot of engagement. But they're dumb. End of video. Kidding. La 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 la. All right. So now we get into the problems with tier lists. And throughout this, I'm going to use an example from Mr. Jeff Nippard. Um, if you can't tell from my recent videos, I uh, have been on a weightlifting kick. Well, not a kick. I've been weightlifting for a couple years now. But I tend to watch a lot of weightlifting videos. So why not? Why not choose to comment on something that I have some background in? Um, by the way, Jeff Nippard. Love Jeff Nippard. Great guy. Very informative channel. Just not a fan of his use of tier lists. So... Ain't nothing but love for you, Jeffy boy. Number one problem that I have with tier lists is they collapse multiple variables into one. For example, for a chest movement to rank highly, it needs to tick three boxes. One, a big stretch with high tension. If it doesn't offer high tension in a deep stretch, I'm putting it in F tier, no exceptions. Two, it needs to feel good. It shouldn't cause pain and it should have a smooth resistance profile giving a good pump and a nice mind-muscle connection would be nice too. Three, it needs to have a simple progression. If you can't progressively overload by adding weight or reps, that's not good. So Mr. Nippard here is evaluating each of the exercises on three separate criteria. Progressive overload, the stretchness of it, and how much he can feel the muscle engagement with that particular exercise. Those are three very distinct categories and yet they get collapsed into one. I have a problem with that. And the basic idea is that you have multiple variables feeding into one thing, and that can be very problematic. So let's think of an example of where this could be problematic. Let's say you're ranking potential partners in dating based on two characteristics, their attractiveness 
and how likely they are to commit tax fraud. And when you collapse into a single unit, you might say, all right, S tier is those who are smoking hot and commit minor white collar crimes. A tier is cute and audited once. C tier, gorgeous, but offshore accounts in the Caymans. D tier, very honest, but looks as attractive as a pug that has been punched in the face. In this case, you're ranking people as if hotness can cancel out criminality, which could explain a lot of celebrity marriages, but not so great for measurement validity. Or another example, let's say you are ranking hospitals based on the success rate of surgeries for one criteria and for another, the quality of the cafeteria food. So you might have hospitals that are in the S tier because you survive your heart surgery and it has tater tots. And then F tier might be they're great at surgery, but the jello was lukewarm. Great, you've just discovered a new decision making criteria called snack adjusted mortality rates. So yeah, collapsing distinct variables into one is generally a bad idea. Now there are models that you can do that with. We tend to call them uh, principal components models or what's the other name? Formative measurement models. So you can do it, um, but there's lots of potential problems with doing that. Problem number two is waiting. So not all criteria in these rankings should be equally weighted when ranking things, or at least it's very rare that they should be equally weighted. In psychometrics, we would call this uh, equivalent factor loadings or tau equivalents. And that's kind of rare. You very rarely get tau equivalent models. And so when you combine these into one and you are basically treating them as equal, that could be problematic. So just as an example, this whole deep stretch idea of muscles is a very new idea in exercise science. And it's all the rage now. But I would guess that in this video, Jeff Nippard probably isn't giving them equal weight. I would guess, and based on the video, it looks like he's giving more weight to the deep stretch idea. If it doesn't offer high tension in a deep stretch, I'm putting it in F tier, no exceptions. And so the idea with a deep stretch is like, let's say you're doing a bench press. If you have an exercise that requires a lot of exertion when the muscle is fully stretched out like this, you get slightly more growth than an exercise that maybe if you start halfway up, you're not pushing hard at the deep stretch point, And so you get less gains, but the amount of gains that you get is very tiny. And it really only matters if you're like a bodybuilder who's been doing it for like 15 years. But because it's a new idea, Mr. Nippard here is overly weighting the deep stretch idea and underly weighting some of the other things that are probably more important. Progressive overload, that's kind of a big deal. And progressive overload means that you are gradually adding more and more weight or more and more volume or whatever as time goes on. So certain exercises lend themselves to progressive overload quite well. Like if you're doing a bench press, you can always add more weight to it. But if you're doing push-ups, it's not so easy. You could like wear a backpack, but that's kind of a little weird to do and not very easy to do. And so the ability to progressively overload is probably going to be super important. So I would guess that its factor weight would be higher than the factor weight for the deep stretchiness of the exercise. Number three or number four. Can't remember what number I'm on. Arbitrary color coding. So people tend to use arbitrary colors. And why is that a problem? This is problematic from a plotting perspective. So when I look at a tier ranking like this and I see a color, my brain wants to believe that that color has meaning, but it doesn't. It's just there for aesthetics. And I tend to be of the opinion that when you're plotting something, that decisions should focus much less on aesthetics and much more on visual perception. So if you make a choice with a plot, like using color, then that color ought to communicate something about your data. And maybe if there was a gradient, like from a deep red to a yellow, something like this, that might make sense. In which case the saturation of redness indicates a higher preference. So that might work, but if you're just using arbitrary colors, that's not helpful. And then my final critique is that they fail the interocular trauma test. And I've mentioned the interocular trauma test or the interocular test. And the basic idea is that 
a plot for it to be effective, when you look at it, it smacks you right between the eyes. Or in other words, you can look at it and immediately be able to tell what's going on. And scatter plots are great at this. You can look at this plot and immediately know, hey, there's a strong curvilinear relationship between these two variables. In order to understand these tier lists, you have to study the plots. They don't immediately smack you between the eyes. And as I was looking at these, I was like, okay, they kind of sort of look like a rotated histogram, except that the Y axis, not the X axis, like a regular histogram, a histogram assumes that we have interval level data and these are not interval, these are ordinal. So we can't assume the spaces between data points are the same. And it's not like with the histogram, like you expect a normal distribution, but with these rankings, I don't know that you necessarily expect a higher concentration in the middle tiers, but maybe you do, I don't know. But even then, if you're looking at one of these tier lists, you're not trying to look at the concentration of data. You're probably just trying to figure out, all right, which is the best? In which case you don't need a graphic. You can use a table. And by the way, I have an opinion. Oh, I have lots of opinions, if you didn't know that. But I have an opinion that uh, I don't know that I've seen anybody else communicate this. Maybe I'll make a separate video about this. So I am a visualization guy, and you would think as a visualization guy that I would be in favor of plotting everything, and that's not true. And here's my opinion that is fairly newly formed and probably not a good opinion that I will dissect later. Visuals should only be used if they communicate something beyond what a table can communicate. And so these rankings, the visual aspect adds practically nothing, especially if you just want to figure out which chest exercise in this example is best. Well, you could just report that in a table. You don't need a tier list. You don't need a graphic. So that's a summary of the problems that I have with these tier lists. So what would I do differently? Fantastic question. The biggest problem with these tier lists is that they collapse multiple variables into one dimension. So what I would actually do is I would not collapse those multiple variables into different dimensions. So what I might do instead is have a Cartesian plot with a Y axis that represents maybe progressive overload potential. And then an X axis that represents the degree to which you could feel muscle engagement when using that exercise. Now, of course, that leaves out the third dimension, but we could plot that as a separate color, like in this plot. And then each of the dots might represent each of the different exercises, like bench press might be here, cable flies might be here, etc. I think that would be way more informative so why is this better? Well, let's go through the reasons that I don't like the original list and see how this plot fixes things. One, collapsing multiple variables into one. Well, it's not doing that anymore, is it? Each variable gets its own separate dimension. Two, weighting. Well, we've kind of bypassed that argument before we were trusting Jeff Nippard's weighting of these various exercises. Whereas now you can choose for yourself. Maybe you're an experienced lifter where getting activation in the deep stretch is super important to you, in which case you might put that on the y-axis. Maybe the second most important criteria is progressive overload potential. Then you can find those exercises that fall into this quadrant. So it fixes the weighting issue. It fixes the arbitrary color coding because we're still not using arbitrary colors unless we encode the third dimension as a color. And what about the interocular test? Well, I think this does a pretty good job. What it doesn't do, it's not like you could look at this for a fraction of a second and know exactly what's going on. You still have to study the plot, but it's much easier to study the plot when it's presented like this. And it's much more informative to study the plot. So it makes it super easy to find the exercise that you're looking for. And going back to our hospital example, if you're going in for like a appendectomy or something that's like standard procedure, and you don't care about the quality of the procedure because any doctor could basically do it and you really care about the cafeteria food, you're in luck. My tier list will help. The old tier list won't. At least it requires a lot more effort to figure out what's going on with the old tier list. So, in conclusion, yeah, these tier lists uh, might be fun, but they're kind of misleading. They definitely fail as true informative visualizations and certainly fail as measurement tools. So I guess the take home message here is if you're going to measure things or if you're going to score things or if you're going to rank things, be very clear about what your criteria are and then plot a visual that actually makes sense. Otherwise, just use a table. 
Of course, that doesn't make for a very engaging YouTube video. Oh, uh, top chest exercises ranked. Here's the best. I don't know. Sometimes people like pretty graphs. Whatever. So yeah, I think it's way better to use visualizations that preserve nuance and allow for trade-offs when making judgments. So I was going to conclude this video about making a tier list of where you can take stats classes. Um, <laughs> but like I said, you don't need a graphic if you can communicate it in a table and you, and you don't need a table if you can communicate it with words. So I'm just going to communicate it with words. Take a class from me. That's the best place to take it. No other competitors. So visit simplistics.net. I have both live classes where you can interact with me through Zoom. And I got two coming up, an office hours class and a mixed models class. Or you can take them at your own pace. And for those, I have lots of classes. I've got an R class. I've got an intro to stats class, which I call Simplistics. I've got a mixed models class. And I've got a data mining and visualizations class. So there's lots to choose from. And by the way, I'm working on a generalized linear model class. So like... Logistic regression and Poisson. So let me know if you're interested in that. And depending on what you say will determine my motivation to work on it. All right, my sweet, sweet students that I adore. Great to see you. Great to hang out. Hope you had fun. And I will see you next time. Peace out. Why are we using these tier list thingies? I do feel deeply in my soul that your presentation would benefit from a tier list ranging from S to F, just like they got on that there YouTube. What? You have the gall to suggest to me to do a tier list? No. What is with our fascination for cringy things? Like, why do we like cringy things? I don't know, maybe that's why half of you are here, because you enjoy cringe. They call me Mr. Cringe, woo! I have a PhD and I have earned the right to be annoyed when somebody tries to comment on things related to my expertise. That's the whole reason you get a PhD, so you can be arrogant and stuff like that. How do you know if your effect size is big enough? Well, it is big enough if it fits properly, I suppose. Effect sizes? Oh, right. Uh, there are universal standards that uh, I don't rather pay attention to. Well, that wasn't all that helpful. I hate to break it to you, but I am absolutely straight. Last time I looked at a dude. An attractive dude, like Henry Cavill? Good looking guy. But it incites in me feelings of jealousy, not romance. Although I think the most attractive movie star out there has got to be Chris Hemsworth. Man. That guy is a good looking guy. Yeah, did I say otherwise? I know that. He was named after Mr. Fish himself. That's all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ba -da -da.